the evidence of the eyewitness testimony within the Gospels is overwhelming. There is no doubt that the modern church in America has failed its people by not teaching them the earliest stages of church history. Thank you for tuning into Facts, a podcast that primarily focuses on the church fathers, the apocryphal works, the canon of scripture, the text of scripture, and the scripture itself. You can find more information about us on explorechristianity.net. Thank you again for tuning in. Yes, thank you again for tuning into this episode of Facts. I'm your host, Stephen Boyce, and today we're going to be talking about what could be perceived as a controversial subject, but I think it's one that needs to be had over the last few years, particularly here in the West, uh, as it relates to the office of clergy or priesthood or presbytery, pastor, deacon, whatever term you want to add to it, what role does the female sex play into these offices? Uh, it comes up frequently in debate. It comes up frequently in discussion. It comes up frequently in churches. And it's it's almost annually, there's some major debate. There's some publication. There's an article. There's a council that brings this issue up. Now, it should be noted that when you're looking at it from certain perspectives, uh, say the Roman Catholic perspective, this is of no debate. Uh, this issue has been settled through magisterium long time ago, a long time ago. Eastern Orthodoxy does not struggle with this. Coptic churches typically don't struggle with this. Most of the issues are Protestant in their ideas or in their concepts that would say, well, there is uh, am ambiguity and confusion or just cultural differences when Paul wrote his letter to Timothy. And therefore, what was said then was more of a culture reason as to why we shouldn't have women pastors, women priestesses, or uh, women that are involved in these, sub uh, these different titles and subjects. And what I want to do today is not necessarily focus on Paul, because I think that one is clear. Even people that are honest would say, yes, Paul said that they could not serve this role. But the reason why they could not serve this role is because of culture. So we're not even going to dispute that. However, what we are going to talk about today, and I even have slides to those that are watching this on Facebook Live, those that are listening uh, on the podcast, facts, you're going to just have to listen carefully as I bring this subject to pass, as we go through it, looking at the different discoveries, councils, individual statements from bishops and leaders in these churches and what they had to say. Because one of the things that we need to particularly focus on when it comes to this subject is if you are a church that holds to the creeds, you hold to any kind of creedal language, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, or you believe in the world councils and the ecumenical councils that have met together. And we're going to look at two of them in a minute, being the Council of Nicaea, uh, also the Council of Laodicea from the same church that the Apostle John had written to in the book of Revelation. Paul had also uh, had written to the Colossians, telling them to send copies of that letter to the Laodicea in that same area, same churches, same leaders. Because this came up, not just in a modern idea. And I think that is the myth that we need to lose sight of. Well, culturally, that was not the case in the time of Paul, and they didn't have the issues that we do today. Actually, they did have a issue that arose. Now, I did an episode on this uh, not long ago, women in the clergy positions, and you can go back into the podcast and find that in the archives. And I don't want to go into that dynamic the way I'm going to handle this, although they'll be similar and crossing over. One of the things that I think needs to be noted in today's episode is that if we are going to hold to creedal language, particularly councils, uh, we're looking at the idea of Nicaea, well, they spoke not just into the issue of deity. Uh, the Council of Nicaea did have a lot to say about the deity of Christ, even producing a creed as a result, but the canons of Nicaea also spoke to the issue of women 
in the role of presbyter or priestesses. And the reason they did this is because the issues in the second century particularly created controversy when women were being instituted almost into a worshipful position. We see this in the Gnostic text, in the development of the Gnostic text. And I've done episodes on the subject of the Gospel of Mary. We've talked about the development of the Gospel of Thomas, all the way to saying 114, and that it's progressive and that it's allowing uh, the idea of women and kingdom and authority. Women became almost worshipped by the end of the second century in some of the Christian cultures. So as we fast forward into the second century, going into the third and the fourth, the churches started allowing and permitting women into the role of priestesses and also allowing dynamics to where they were authorities within the church. So that created controversy. These institutions, these churches, these councils had to start making, making declarations to clarify what the apostolic position had always been. And so what I want to do today is not necessarily stir the waters to create unnecessary controversy, because that's not my goal. My goal is, is as churches, we want to function both biblically and historically in the proper framework. And one of the things that we see in the very beginning stages is the Council of Nicaea's declaration in Canon 19 on the subject of priestesses. They said this, Similarly, in regard to the deaconesses, as with all who are enrolled in the registry, the same produce uh, procedure is to be observed. We have made mention of the deaconesses who have enrolled in this position, although not having been in any way ordained, they are certainly to be numbered amongst the laity. Now, one of the things that we see from here is that there was a role of deaconesses but not a role of priestesses. Now, the deaconesses were ordained, and we see considerably the nature of that in Romans chapter number 16. Uh, I just recently put out both a blog and an episode on recapturing and really bringing back the original form of what a deacon or a deaconess was in the early church. If you missed that, you can find the blog on explorechristianity.net under the blog section. If you want to find the audio of that, just scroll down just a few weeks ago in the archives. You'll find an entire episode on that, both on YouTube and on the Facts podcast. And in that, I talk about what the deacon and the deaconess did. And the reason that the controversy around the deacon perspective came so great is because in modern times, we have wrongly used the office of deacon to be equal to the office of elder, creating its own mayhem and problems in relation to that. But as it relates to the Council of Nicaea, they did permit deaconesses and recognize the apostles' churches as forming that role to aid in the work of ministry. And we're going to see examples of what they were doing. But when it comes to the office of priest or priestesses, they were never permitted in the office. The Council of Laodicea, not long after this, around 360, stated this, the so-called priestesses or presidentesses are not to be ordained in the church. So one of the things that the Council of Laodicea stated is that there was this so-called, and I want to focus on that term, so-called. People ask me all the time, do you believe that the office of pastor, women pastors or women uh, priestesses or presbyteresses, do you believe that there is such an office? And here's my question and answer to them. Number one, what do you mean? What, what do you mean by pastor? Because I typically want to know what, what background there. Are you Baptist, Presbyterian? when you use these terms. So that way we're all on the same page. Once that is established, I do give it an answer. And I say, there is no such thing as a priestess. It was a idea that was ran, not just in modern times, introduced in Europe and the United States, and then later in other formations of the, of, of the world. Rather, this was something that we've seen very, very early on. 
that even the early churches and their councils had to address. And Laodicea made sure to clarify the so-called office that is being posed in some churches, calling women priestesses or presbyteresses. They never existed. And they should not be ordained in the apostles' churches because they were never perceived to belong to such a thing. Now, when I look at this subject, I think the best statement we have is Epiphanius of Salamis. And I think his argument is the best mind exercise for this subject. Take away culture. Take away counsel. Take away creedal language. Let's focus on common sense. Let's focus on looking at this from a perspective that he is going to bring the office to and bring in an individual that I think shines much light to this subject. Now, keep in mind that the office of priest or presbyter, president in some terminology like Justin Martyr and even Laodicea used, the office was meant for sacrament practice, issuing out baptisms, following liturgical approaches, offering the Eucharist to the people. And that pattern goes back to the washings and the sacrificial system of the Aaronic priesthood. And let me just say within that, to repeat what I said in previous episodes, this is not a matter of the sexes. This is a matter of qualification for the office. When you look at the Aaronic priesthood, not just anyone could be a priest, male and female. No one from the priesthood could have allowed someone from the tribe of Ephraim or the tribe of Judah or the tribe of Manasseh to put on the priestly garb to offer sacrifices in the temple and tabernacle on behalf of the people. They would have dropped dead, folks. The minute that an, a, a person from the tribe of Ephraim would have put on the priestly garb, offered all the ceremonial washings and blood sacrifice, and went into the most holy place, that individual would have dropped dead because he was unqualified. Not because he was not because of his gender, but because he did not meet the strict criteria that is given and instituted by God for the office of priesthood. It's not an issue of gender. It's not an issue necessarily as it relates to a person's social status or his skill or his giftedness in the sense of like he's good at doing things. It is an issue of qualification where there is a distinct gift of the Holy Spirit for that office. And in the wisdom of God and the Holy Spirit, he saw fit to only ordain qualified men, not men, qualified men for this office. We have turned this into a gender war when it was never meant to be a gender war. It was not a part of the original design. In fact, when Paul addressed the subject, he addressed it through the lens of the creation narrative, not societal pool. He went back to the narrative of Adam and Eve and God's original design for the two genders becoming one unit and their and their function within male and female god instituted things for females that males have no need and gifting in uh, we would be terrible mothers we would be terrible at birth we would be terrible at carrying children men are not qualified to do this thing. And, 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 and I know our society is trying to manipulate and change that where men can carry babies. That is not in God's design. It's not an equality issue where men and women should be able to do the same things. It is distinction in beauty in distinction for that matter, that we would have different roles in our world 
to complement each other in a world of diversity that God intentionally created to bring one intentional end, the glory of God in the advancement of that glory ends in advancing his kingdom. And therefore, male and female all have a role in this function. But Epiphanius, I think, produces for us the best exercise of thought when initiating the subject. He states this, from the Bishop James the Just. Now think back, this is Jesus's half brother. We're going into the discussion of the Bishop of Jerusalem in its earliest stage to the beginning of its council. And the just named apostles, the succession of bishops and presbyters or priests in the house of God have been established. Meaning, Epiphanius is saying the, the role of bishop and, and priest has always been made clear from the time of James the Just in, in Jerusalem and all the, the apostles in their churches. This matter is settled. You see, this is why I don't think there's room for debate here. This is one place I do appreciate the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. It is an established, settled, final decision that is irrevocable. It has been decided a long time ago and is not able to be changed. Uh, that is something that I think other uh, areas, including uh, Anglican backgrounds and so forth, can improve on. I think we need to make more definitive. Now, there has been on the office of bishop, uh, particularly in some of the groups of Anglican uh, communions, but I think we need to dive into this historically and reasonably without creating division by war because it's not an issue of war. It's an issue of doing the right thing and the best thing and more importantly, the biblical thing for our churches. It's, it's an issue of health. It's not an issue of salvation. It's not an issue of hell or heaven. It's not an issue of giftedness or not giftedness. It's not an issue of qualification when it comes to people being better at speaking or preaching or teaching or decision making or discernment. Not that any of those things aren't important. That's not the debate. That's not the issue. There are certainly far more women in some contexts that are more qualified for public speaking, discernment, decision making than men. That's not the issue of debate, and that shouldn't be the issue of the debate. The issue of debate is the office of, of bishop and priest and pastor and presbyter, or if you would, clergy, and what did the biblical text establish, and what did the historical councils follow in, and what did the apostles train their successors to do when it comes to this issue? And Epiphanius said that the apostles have established this matter. It has been settled already. Notice the next phrase. Never was a woman called to these. Not one or the other. Not just the bishopric, but the clergy as a whole has never called women to these positions. Now, this is not... A, a idea of an individual church. This isn't an idea of an individual council. What we're learning from Epiphanius is this has been the teaching that has been declared and archived in all of the churches of the apostles from the beginning to his day. And he states, according to the evidence of scripture, there were to be sure the four daughters of the evangelist Philip who engaged in prophecy, but they were not priestesses. So let's pause here on that claim right there. So one of the things that he is saying is that there were prophetesses. And he gives an example in the scriptures from the book of Acts. That Philip had four virgin daughters who became prophetesses. They had a voice in the church. So let me uh, just hit one extreme here because there's two extremes. 
Uh, the extreme is we're going to ordain them to, uh, to, to try to keep equality and unity and peace, which goes against scriptural historical mandates. Then there's the other extreme here where it is women are only allowed to teach children and to be silent the rest of the time in the church. So let me hit that extreme. That is not what the scriptural mandates teach. That is not what we have been taught historically or biblically. There were prophetesses who were vocally declaring, thus says the Lord in the church. They had a voice amongst the people and were known by their title, prophetesses. Now, they were not that common in relation to what we see in the, the bishopric and the, in the apostolic group, as well as those that were functioning uh, within the succession line, succession lines of the apostles and their leaders and the elders and what was being ordained. Those were all males. But there were at times women who had gifts of speech to declare, thus says the Lord, to the church. Now, I think the problem has come where we have conflated two offices, uh, where all teaching ministry in the church has fallen particularly on the pastor and the pastor only, and that has become the problem. But the gifting of the pastor was separate from teachers. Although pastors have to be qualified to teach, uh, all pastors have to be teachers, but not all teachers are pastors in the church. And this office of pastor was distinguished from what was in the church at that time prophetesses. Now there is debate whether or not we need that function of prophetesses. And by the way, when you think of that term in the New Testament, do not think of foretelling only like, like Jeremiah or something like that, or Isaiah, Zechariah, Malachi. That's not what we are uh, to think through entirely. Uh, these were people who were just declaring the message of the Lord. It could have been an old prophecy or, or, or just truth in general. Now, I do not believe the prophetesses personally were serving in the gathering sessions by teaching in that way. I think that the church was filled with teaching beyond that Sunday gathering of the saints. I think there was teaching going on all day long throughout the week. The office of priest was there on the gathering to read publicly the scriptures to edify the saints in those scriptures by declaring their meaning, by exegeting the text, and then turning over to the exposition of scripture, they would serve the people through the table or if those who needed to be baptized. So they were doing the sacraments, if you would. It was only men who were qualified through the office of clergy that performed those duties. And then the prophetesses, perhaps, were more so teaching in the church uh, throughout the week or in certain context and in certain gathering settings, but not through the gathering of the table where the sacraments were being performed. But what should be noted in Epiphanius' statement is that there were evidence of these types of offices existing, but it's almost as if he's insinuating that they're not actually happening even in his day. It was something that happened in the past, and that's something to consider as well. But I like how he continues on in the next slide here to those that are watching, to those that are listening. Again, I'll try to do my best to read slowly so that you could follow along. He says, if women were to be charged by God with entering the priesthood or with assuming ecclesiastical office, then in the new covenant, it would have devolved upon no one more than Mary to fulfill a priestly function. She was invested with so great an honor as to be allowed to provide a dwelling in her womb for the heavenly God and King of all things, the Son of God. But he, God, did not find this, the conferring of priesthood on her, to be good. I, I, I cannot emphasize this enough. What a wonderful thought and exercise to consider in relation to this subject. If there was a woman on God's planet 
that was qualified for the priesthood, qualified for an apostle or a successor in its bishopric, or to be a part of council and decision-making and, and function of sacraments, who would be more qualified than Mary? She had in with, within her womb the heavenly God and king of all things. She carried God in the flesh in her womb. She was greatly favored among women. What other woman has the highest praise than our view of Mary? Can't think of any. So if women were going to be, were to be instituted into this role in the new covenant, notice the words of Epiphanius in the new covenant. If that would have happened, the initiation of women being put in that position would have started with Mary, the mother of Jesus. What's to be noted? We go to Acts 1. She's there in the upper room with the apostles. It is not her doing the speaking or the ordaining of another apostle. Then we go into the uh, apostolic age. We start finding decisions being made, uh, churches being formed, initial elders being laid, and their names, all of which are males. In Acts 15, we see the Council of Jerusalem gathering together to discover the decision that needed to be made on the issue of circumcision for Gentiles. Names of the apostles that are there. We know that James was there. We know Paul was there. We know Peter was there. Uh, and, and pillars of the church, the apostles and their elders are there. All men. Mary was not permitted to this office. Mary was not given opportunity to speak in the council. She was not even present to our knowledge at the council. So what does that mean? What does that mean for us? If God intended for women priestesses or bishops to be publicized in the church from the earliest transmission of the office, we would have seen Mary, the mother of Jesus, become a beginner, a forerunner for that work. And Mary was not as qualified of a woman as she was and as great of an opportunity God gave that young woman to do the work she was able to do by bearing within her own womb the Son of God. That woman did not meet the criteria of priestesses. And he noticed what he says, but he did not find this, the conferring of the priesthood on her to be good. God saw her qualified to carry himself in the flesh. And what a beautiful thing, but not qualified to lead the church in the sacraments. What a thought. And I think the best argument against this See, folks, it's, it's, it's not a cultural thing. It's a new covenant thing. Just in the old covenant, it wasn't an anti, oh, I'm anti-Judah or I'm anti-Ephraim or I'm anti-women. Only Levites could be priests. Qualified Levites who followed proper ritual. In the new covenant, in the office of sacraments to the priesthood, it is only for those males who are qualified. I like what one church father says that all of the, the human race must bow out. The women of uh, the world, the, the women have to bow out of the qualification of this office. And most men must also bow out of this office. And I'm paraphrasing. And it's, if you think about it, the qualified males in the world that are qualified to be a priest or a presbyter elder in the church is less than 1% of the human population. See, it's not, it's not like 100% of women are disqualified from this office and, and men are qualified. 
No, 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 no. It's more like 99.9% of humanity is disqualified from this gifting. And less than 1% is actually qualified. You see, we, we, we need to look at it from that perspective. It's not a gender thing. It's a qualification thing. And most men in the world are not qualified and gifted for this role. And therefore, most men must resist the desire for it because the gifting of it is very, very limited in whom God brings in. One more slide here from the Apostolic Constitutions. And again, there's many more if you want to go back to that episode. Again, it's in the archives, but let's just end it with the Apostolic Constitutions. A deaconess does not bless. So she's not, she's not doing sacramental blessings, but neither does she perform anything else that is done by the priest or the presbyters and deacons. So there are deaconesses that work alongside of male deacons, but she guards the door and greatly assists the presbyters for the sake of decorum when they are baptizing women. And we find other places where uh, they were also helping with sick uh, women who were unclothed, who were being inspected when pr presbyters and elders would come in and pray over them. Uh, there would be times where it would put a compromising position. Uh, there would be an issue of compromise between the male leader and a female who's being baptized or being prayed over in, in sick beds that would have been exposed. So women would go in, guard the doors, protect uh, nakedness and things like that. Uh, they were also, as we learned, serving the Eucharist table. They were not performing the sacrament, but they were helping serve the sacraments, uh, including taking them to people that could not make uh, the gatherings. Uh, we saw two deaconesses, uh, according to Pliny, that were being arrested. If you go back to that episode on the on the office of deacon. Uh, women deaconesses were arrested and investigated and tortured for information about the church. They were probably sending out the Eucharist to people in the community who could not make the gathering. So they were very much involved in these kinds of things. The, the problem is they did not bless because they were not presbyters. They were not elders or priests. And therefore they were aides, helpers, to serve in, in the capacity of sickness and baptism and Eucharist. They were not doing the physical blessings themselves, but there were deaconesses in the church who did not bless. Now, there were male deacons, if you read the Apostolic Constitutions, who could bless. Women deaconesses were not given that right, though they could carry the term and the title the one thing they could not do is bless. And that needs to be uh, understood and noted within the apostolic constitutions and the way the church was functioning, how the churches were doing their blessings. Women were not a part of that cultural information or in that, in that state of blessing. But the males were that were qualified deacons and presbyters. So what have we learned? How do, how do we break this down? How do we apply this to modern culture, formation? I think we start with stop. Uh, we start by stopping the unnecessary debate about gender or gender equality. It's not a gender issue. And, and, and as I stated, we need to accept that almost all men in the world are also disqualified for this role. It's a unique gifted position that God and his wisdom ordained to be only certain qualified gifted men to serve his people in the sacraments. That does not mean they are, um, uh, there are not women who cannot serve in our churches who cannot speak, who cannot act, who cannot talk, who cannot serve, who cannot help. That's not the case at all. We need all Christians to perform their gifts 
in their gathered congregations week in and week out. All Christians, male and female, are part of the priesthood of believers. So in a sense, yes, women are initiated into the priesthood of the believer, which gives them access to God just as much as a man who can have just as much of a gift of the spirit and the pouring of the spirit on their life as a man who can have a spiritual outpour of God's work in their life of salvation, living out their baptism, living in light of the gospel, bringing people to faith, serving in the church, given a spiritual opportunity. All of those things are true for females and males. So the debate never needs to uh, take place in that platform and in that model. Where it should take place is in the unique office of Presbyter priesthood, where the sacraments are performed, we are strict to the qualifications given by, by God, the apostles, and their successors, and the councils. Listen, don't, don't say that what we believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and go through the whole entire Nicene Creed and ignore Nicaea's decision on this issue. Let's be consistent in our approach. Let's be consistent in our practice. Let's not pick and choose what we want from these things. This has always been the position from the time of James and Justin in Jerusalem to the apostles and all the churches they began. It is a pressing matter. I do not think this is a, a issue of just opinion. I don't think this is uh, the difference of preference of music or how you do your liturgy or how you do your layout. I don't think it's that minor of an issue as some may have put weight to it. It is a essential issue in the church because we're talking about the qualification of serving God's people with sacraments. That is not a small thing. And it was not a small thing to send the wrong person or a person that should not have been doing certain things that they were not called to. May I give you a quick example in the Old Testament where Samuel had to scold Saul for trying to offer sacrifices as a Benjamite, not a priest from Levi. God did not take that lightly. It was the first step to him losing his kingdom and his and his authority that God gave him and his spiritual outpour from God, that was the first step to losing it. I don't believe the office of priesthood or presbyter, clergy or bishopric, anything you want to label, is a disputable matter in the church. I think it is an essential matter that has been established that we culturally have opened back up because of our post-enlightenment culture who wants to make everybody be able to do the same thing, not just pastoring churches, but as far as men carrying women in a womb, so to speak, to try to duplicate that men can even do what women do. We have gone insane with this thing. We have created a battle war division within the church on this subject. And it's not needed because the parts that are being argued and debated are not the main issues at all anyway. It's two extreme groups trying to, to resolve an issue that's not needed. We need to get out of the extremes. We need to get back to the biblical practice, the historical practice, the practice of the councils, in the canons that they laid out for this subject and fall suit with the blessing of God to our churches. If God instituted it this way, whether you like that or I like that or not, I have a lot of good friends that are men who are phenomenal teachers, tremendous decision makers, witty, intelligent, very involved in their church. But if they were in the office of 
clergy, they would not help their church. They would hurt it. Doesn't mean that person has no place in that church and no voice and no wisdom and no input and no thought and no help and no initiation. It doesn't mean that, that these men that I know are not qualified to do functional work in the church. It's just that role. The same is true of many women I know in the church. Keep the battlefield where it actually is, not where the culture has put it. Women have a place in church. They have a voice in church. They have an activity in church. They have a use in church. They have a say in church. The element of clergy is not that place, along with many other men. So let's be fair to the argument, be honest with the biblical text, honest with the history, honest with the councils. And yes, it is an essential issue. And if we do it wrong, we are losing out on the privileges of God working. Now, I have received questions on this from the last episode, and I'll say this in closure, in the closing of this episode. I said something similar in the last episode, and somebody had sent a message back to me and said, well, what about men who are not qualified who are also doing these works? And here's exactly what I said. The answer I gave for how this hurts us with women doing it, the same damage is done for unqualified men doing it. And the example I used was the one I just gave you with King Saul. Saul was a man, not a woman, a man who usurped the office of priest in his day when he was a Benjamite, not qualified to do the sacrificing and it cost him and it cost the nation. So my answer is, how essential is this issue? It's essential because we're dealing with the priesthood and sacraments and the issuing of sacraments. And if we get that wrong, we are hurting ourselves. That's not just true by putting a woman in place, but a man in place who also is not qualified to do that work. Both equally damage the office and both equally damage the the function of sacrament and the spirit's work in them so that's the position that is that is the conclusion that i hold to this subject we have to handle these matters with very close and and, and essential care because we're not attacking people that's not the intent here we're trying to do right by God's by God's institution and establishment and allow the spirit to work in that establishment to the fullest, the greatest outpour and anointing because we are dedicating ourselves in obedience to his laws and his commandments and his, in his establishments and his precepts. And I want that for my church, your church, in God's church as a whole. And I think we need to have these conversations. I think we need to put these things on the table. We need to do it the right way, the right attitude, the right disposition, and make sure the argument is actually where it belongs and the battlefield is actually being fought over what matters, not what doesn't matter. So perfect opportunity to close that. And again, as always, thanks for tuning in. If you have questions, you can comment in the YouTube video. I'll go by uh, back behind it and check that. If you're following us for the first time, please like and subscribe on YouTube. If you're following on one of our platforms on Facts, whether that's Spotify, Apple, or even maybe Google, and you're following us on these different uh, platforms, please make sure you uh, like and subscribe to our episodes as new ones come out. Just to give you a quick breakdown of what's coming, uh, Tyler West and I are going to be doing next week a episode on our journey to Anglicanism. It was one of the highest requested on social media when we put the question out. Uh, it was a long journey for both of us, uh, about three to four years. And uh, some think that it just maybe happened overnight. Uh, and they were like, where did this come from? Well, we're both going to share our story and our journey. And just to clarify, that journey and story is not meant to be for everyone that listens. We realize that I have multiple followers who are from different backgrounds and church backgrounds. And we don't want to, 
uh, use that time to say you should follow what we did. What we are going to do is just share our story and our journey. And we believe God will, will do something special in that by informing you and seeing how the Lord has worked in our lives. Uh, also, there will be another episode following up with Eric Yabara, the Roman Catholic friend, my Roman Catholic friend, who was on just recently. And if you missed that, uh, go back on YouTube or on the Facts Podcast. We talked about the most recent declaration by Pope Francis and Cardinal Fernandez, uh, who put out a uh, blessing of same-sex unions of individuals coming before to receive a blessing, not in a sacramental way, but in a uh, pastoral way to help them in their personal lives, et cetera, et cetera. We already did that, but there's a follow-up coming. Uh, so keep your eyes open for that because there's more information that's come out about Cardinal Fernandez and a book that he published at one point that was very much out of line. Uh, that'll be coming as well. And also my wife and I uh, will be doing an episode together on the blessing of marriage and why we believe it's important for the church, its leaders to bless uh, marriages and Christian marriages that are working uh, to live out the gospel within their unions and focusing on blessing the right kind of marriage. Also, keep your eyes open for a blog that'll be coming uh, in an article that'll be published by myself and uh, one of the rectors at my church at Harvest Anglican, uh, Pat May. He and I are co-writing an article on the subject of blessing Christian marriages within the church. It's a call for pastors, uh, priests, clergy, bishops to set aside time in a service soon uh, that would bring all of the couples that are married and dedicated to their marriage, struggling or healthy, and have pastoral prayer over their marriage and bless their marriage to counter culture what we're seeing in the Church of England and the Roman Catholic Church and other secular uh, institutions that are in, in, infiltrating our churches. So we are actually going to be calling leaders to think deeply on the subject and to set aside a time to bless the kind of marriages we want in addition to calling out the kind of marriages we believe are unlawful in the eyes of God. So keep an eye open for all these. There's a lot of things coming, a lot of uh, discussions. I'll also be going on other programs and YouTube channels soon. Very, very busy schedules ahead. Stay tuned for all of that. I trust the Lord will be good to you and bless you through this time as we celebrate a new year and we're going through all of these things of life and busyness with family and church and sports. God bless you and may God keep you in his peace, grace and peace to you. 